This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 75. Coming up on Space Time. A giant galaxy cluster discovered hiding in plain sight. A landing site chosen for the Hayabusa 2 sample return mission. And the Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos begins its investigation into the space station leak. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have uncovered a sprawling new galaxy cluster hiding in plain sight. A report in the Astrophysical Journal claims the cluster, which sits about 2.4 billion light years away, is composed of hundreds of individual galaxies, all surrounding an extremely active supermassive black hole quasar. This central quasar, catalogued as PKS 1353-341, is so intensely bright that for decades astronomers observing it in the night sky always assumed that it was alone in its corner of the universe, shining out as a solitary beacon from the centre of a single galaxy. But in reality, this quasar's light so bright, it's obscured hundreds of galaxies clustered around it, like a bunch of candles being obscured by the glare of a lighthouse beam. The new data shows hundreds of individual galaxies in the cluster with a combined mass well over 690 trillion suns. By comparison, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 400 billion solar masses. The quasar at the centre of this cluster has now been calculated to be some 46 billion times brighter than the Sun. Its extreme luminosity is likely the result of a black hole feeding frenzy. As material swirls around in the quasar's accretion disk, huge chunks of matter from the disk are falling into the black hole, feeding it and causing it to radiate massive amounts of energy as light. One of the study's authors, Assistant Professor Michael McDonald from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, says this might just be a short-lived phase that clusters go through, where one of the black holes gets a quick meal, gets very bright, but then fades away again. Or this could be a blip that scientists happen to be seeing. In another million years' time, the same region may look like just a diffuse fuzzball. McDonald and colleagues believe the discovery of this hidden cluster shows that there may be many other similar galaxy clusters hiding behind extremely bright objects that astronomers have miscatalogued as single light sources. The researchers are now looking for more hidden galaxy clusters, which could be important clues to estimating how much matter there is in the universe and how fast the universe is expanding. Back in 2012, McDonald and colleagues discovered the Phoenix Cluster, one of the most massive and luminous galaxy clusters in the universe. For McDonald, the mystery is why this cluster, which was so intensely bright and in a region of sky that's easily observable, hadn't been found before. McDonald's put it all down to preconceived notions of what astronomers think galaxy clusters should look like. And because the cluster didn't conform to those ideas, scientists missed it. You see, for the most part, astronomers have always assumed that galaxy clusters look, well, they look sort of fluffy, giving off a very diffuse signal in the X-ray band. And that's very unlike brighter point-like sources, which are interpreted as being extremely active quasars or black holes. So, the images are either all point sources or they're fluffs. And the fluffs are these giant billion light-year balls of hot gas we call galaxy clusters while the point sources are black holes that are accreting gas and glowing as matter spirals inwards. McDonald says astronomers just didn't think that a rapidly accreting black hole at the centre of a cluster happened in nature. And that's where the Phoenix discovery comes in, because it proved that galaxy clusters could indeed host immensely active black holes, prompting McDonald to wonder whether other nearby galaxy clusters have also been similarly misidentified. To answer that question, the authors set up the Clusters Hiding in Plain Sight, or CHIP survey, to re-evaluate X-ray images taken in the past. For every point source that had previously been identified, the authors noted its coordinates, then they studied it directly in greater detail using the Magellan Telescope in Chile. If they observed a higher than expected number of galaxies surrounding the point source, a sign that the gas may stem from a cluster of galaxies, then the team looked at the source again, using NASA's Earth-orbiting Chandra X-ray Observatory to identify an extended diffuse source around the main point source. While 90% of these sources turned out not to be clusters, a small number were rule-breakers. 
the brightness of the black hole might be related to how much it's eating. This is thousands of times brighter than a typical black hole at the centre of a cluster, so it's very extreme in its feeding. The authors have no idea how long it's been going on for, or how long it will continue to go on for. But finding more of these things will help astronomers understand if it's an important process or just a weird isolated event. If the CHIP survey can find enough of these, astronomers will be able to pinpoint the specific rate of accretion onto a black hole where it switches from generating primarily radiation to generating mechanical energy, the two primary forms of energy output from black holes. And that's why this object's so interesting, because it bucks the trend. Either the central supermassive black hole mass is much lower than expected, or the structure of the accretion flow is abnormal. And that would be interesting because it's these oddballs that teach scientists the most. In addition to shedding light on a black hole's feeding or accretion behaviour, the detection of more galaxy clusters will also help estimate how fast the universe is expanding. If you know where all the galaxy clusters are in the universe, which are the biggest pieces in the universe, and how big they are, and you've got some information about what the universe looked like in the beginning, which we know from the Big Bang, then you can start to map out how the universe expanded. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show so I can tell you about our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Like me, you're into the mysteries of the universe. You want to find out as much as you can, but life gets in the way. And that's where The Great Courses Plus comes in. It lets you find out about the secrets of the universe, astronomy, physics, history, whatever, while at the same time not getting in the way of your day-to-day life. With The Great Courses Plus, you get unlimited access to fascinating audio and video lectures on thousands of topics presented by professors and lecturers who really know their stuff. And so while you can dive deeper into string theory, dark matter and dwarf planets, you can also look at other things such as photography, learn a language, art or the Civil War. It's all up to you. There are literally over 10,000 lectures to choose from and new ones are being added all the time. And you can enjoy watching and listening to these lectures anywhere, anytime with the Great Courses Plus app. One course I've been doing and which I can recommend to you is all about black holes, tides and curved space-time. It's called Understanding Gravity and it's presented by Professor of Physics Dr Benjamin Schumacher. In Lecture 7 you'll learn all about orbital mechanics and how Sir Isaac Newton was the first to realise that objects in theory could be sent into orbit around the Earth. The lecture opens with this premise and some great animations, demonstrating Newton's theory using a cannonball mounted on top of the world, a simple way to demonstrate what the great man was thinking and very effective at making the point. The course also covers subjects such as the curvature of space-time, tidal effects, gravitational waves and heaps more. If you're into astronomy and physics, this is a great course to get started with from The Great Courses Plus. And to help, we have a special offer, a free trial with unlimited access to the entire Great Courses Plus library. To sign up, go to our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That way they'll know you came from us and you'll be helping to support our show. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, we'll include those URL details in the show notes, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Mission managers have selected a landing site for Japan's latest sample return mission to an asteroid. The Japanese Space Exploration Agency, JAXA, says the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft's mobile asteroid surface scout, mascot, will touch down on a region of the asteroid Ryugu's southern hemisphere, known as MA9. MA9 was chosen over nine other potential landing sites because of its ease of access with fewer boulders compared to other regions of the tiny barren asteroid, and because of its relatively fresh pristine surface regolith, which hasn't been exposed to cosmic radiation as long as other sites. Over the next 18 months, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft will deploy three rover packages onto the asteroid's grey, desolate surface. The first and largest will be the 10kg mascot rover, which will touch down on October 3rd. The $150 million Hayabusa 2 mission, launched aboard a Japanese H-2A rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center south of Tokyo back on December 3rd, 2014, arriving at the asteroid Ryugu 
in June this year. The spacecraft, spending 18 months studying the asteroid's chemical composition, structure, early history and evolution. The 609-kilogram probe carries multiple scientific payload instruments designed for remote sensing and sampling, including optical navigation cameras, a near-infrared spectrometer, a LiDAR radar detection and ranging instrument, a thermal infrared imager and laser rangefinders. Hayabusa 2 also carries four small lander rovers, which will investigate the asteroid surface. The biggest mascot carries an infrared spectrometer, a magnetometer, a radiometer and a camera to image the small-scale structure, distribution and texture of the regolith. It's designed to move across the asteroid surface by simply tumbling to reposition itself for further measurements. Mascot will investigate the surface structure, mineralogical composition, thermal behaviour and magnetic properties of the asteroid. As well as Mascot, there are three other tiny hopping rovers. Two of them, Minerva 21A and Minerva 21B, will land in one package, while the final rover, Minerva 22, will land in a separate package. All will collect data from the asteroid surface. The original Minerva 1 rover flew aboard Japan's first asteroid sampling mission, Hayabusa, which returned samples from the asteroid Itakawa, landing a sample return capsule at the Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia in 2010. Hayabusa 2 will leave Ryugu in December 2019, returning to Earth in December 2020 with samples that will also be returned to the Woomera rocket range. 162173 Ryugu is a potentially hazardous near or near-Earth object belonging to the Apollo group of Earth-crossing asteroids. The 950-metre-wide diamond-shaped space rock is a rare type of asteroid known as the spectral type CG, which includes properties of both common carbonaceous or high-carbon C-type asteroids and relatively rare G-type asteroids, thought to be a derivative of the C-type asteroid, but with strong ultraviolet absorption features, suggesting phyllosilicate minerals such as clays or mica. Ryugu orbits the Sun in retrograde, that is in the opposite direction to which the planets orbit the Sun, and at a distance of between 0.96 and 1.41 astronomical units every 474 Earth days. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. The name Ryugu means a magical underwater palace in Japanese folklore, where a fisherman travelled on the back of a turtle, returning home with a mysterious box, much like Hayabusa 2 returning to Earth with asteroid samples. To find out more about the mission, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. The Japanese have uh, set a date for touchdown on asteroid 162173 Ryugu, um, which is probably incorrectly pronounced, but um, yeah, they're getting pretty excited. This is a, a space rock of about one kilometre in width. That's uh, that's a pretty chunky piece of um, of metal and stone, I imagine. It is. Look, it's an it's a asteroid mission, uh, which I think is very exciting. As you say, it's about a kilometre wide, two-thirds of a mile. It's being visited by a spacecraft called Hayabusa 2. And Hayabusa 1 really made history in the early 2000s because that visited another asteroid and actually had an epic tale of things going wrong and things basically coming good. Hayabusa 1 visited an asteroid called Itokawa, which it rendezvoused with in 2005 after a two-year journey. The idea was that it was going to collect a sample of the asteroid and bring it back to Earth. And it had the most astonishing series of mishaps. As far as I remember, it went into a very strange orbit and wound up going past Venus a couple of times. (laughs) But in fact, it got back in 2010 with a small sample of material from the asteroid. So it was, you know... A successful yep. mission in the end, remarkable. Yeah, the worst of all, it brought back Pikachu. <laughs> yes, that's right, probably did. Mm. Um, but uh, so this is the second version of this, and it's visiting a uh, different asteroid, of course, uh, exactly as you've said, 162173 Ryugu. It's an interesting sort of asteroid. I think it's basically thought to be a sample of the raw material that made up the solar system. So it's one which we could potentially learn a lot about the early history of the solar system by studying. And so there is a plan to bring back a sample from this as well. However, the mission itself has much more scope to it. There's all kinds of things going to happen uh, within the next few months. So the spacecraft has been in orbit 
around the asteroid since June this year. It took about three and a half years to get there. And what is now planned, and the reason why this is in the news, Andrew, is because the mission profile has now been released. Later this month, it's going to launch... Uh, a little, as far as I can work out, it's about the size of a suitcase. It might be smaller, actually. It's only 3.3 kilograms. A little container which will basically be deployed and will have two little robots on board, uh, each of which weighs a kilogram. It's not big stuff, isn't this? It's the size of a packet of sugar or something like that. Mm. Uh, these two robots, they move across the surface of the asteroid actually by hopping, because they've got the sort of thing that's inside your mobile phone. It's, uh, as far as I can work out, it's a, it's a mass that it rotates and basically sets up a vibration, and this just propels the robot over the surface, so it kind of bounces across the surface. Wow. And so these two little rovers, which will be deployed from the Minerva 2-1 package, basically have lots of imaging equipment on board. They've got wide angle and stereo cameras on board, which will send back pictures, obviously, via the spacecraft itself. And then next month, early in October, there is another lander, which is called Mascot, and that's a joint German-French entity. Mascot's a kind of uh, acronym for mobile, mobile Asteroid Surface Scout. There you go. It's quite, quite a nice one. That's a big one. That weighs 10 kilograms, and that will essentially land on the surface and has wide-angle camera, microscope, radiometers for temperature, uh, things for measuring magnetic field, all that kind of stuff that you expect from, you know, from a scientific package landed on, a, on an asteroid. That also is going to explore the surface. One of the things that is really interesting about this asteroid is that it, it is covered in boulders. And there's a particularly big one near the South Pole of Ryugu. I don't think they're going to go anywhere near that. I think the idea is to stay away from things that, um, that could you know, damage the landers. But then once all that has happened, with these two landers that will deploy on the surface. There is a third one, and that, in fact, is going to detonate a small explosive charge to lift material from beneath the surface of the asteroid that will be sampled by the spacecraft Hayabusa 2, which will descend into the crater that's formed and collect the stuff that's there. The idea being that you, you're looking at a sample to bring back to Earth that has not been irradiated by several billion years of cosmic rays and things of that sort. The spacecraft will leave the vicinity of Ryugu in actually not this year, but next year in December 2019 and come back to Earth about a year later. So uh, amazing stuff. Oh, it's this very is, ambitious by the sound of it, Fred. Yeah, exactly. That's the word I was just about to use. It is very, very ambitious. And they've already tried it once and met with partial success. JAXA, the Japanese space agency, have got some very clever tricks up their sleeve. And I think this is one well worth watching. So the basis of the mission is to go and see what they can see. More or less, that's right. You, you equip with, with every possible you know, means of finding out as much as you can, and, and the icing on the cake is bringing bits of stuff back. Mm. Uh, and, of course, that will be subject to all the normal rules of, of sample return, which is that it, it's uh, in, a, in an isolated environment. It's not released into the atmosphere or anything like that. It's all properly protected, just in case there's some bugs lurking. And underneath. of course, it uh, it just sort of demonstrates hu humanity to a T. We've spent three and a half years traveling this to this thing so we can blow a hole in blow it. Blow a hole in it. <laughs> well, we're pretty good at putting holes in things. That's Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Cosman ought have been asked to gather bits of dried glue and other materials from around the hole which caused a dangerous leak aboard the International Space Station. Atmosphere suddenly began venting into space from the hole in the orbiting outpost three weeks ago. The cause was eventually traced to a hole in the orbital module of the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft which was docked to the Russian segment of the space station. The leak was quickly stopped, initially by someone simply sticking their finger over the hole and then waiting for some duct tape, and then later by a dab of epoxy resin. 
Although initial reports suggested the hole was caused by either micro, meteoroid or space junk impact, when images of the damage were finally released, it clearly showed a drill hole, most likely caused during the manufacturing of the spacecraft at the Russian Energia factory. It seems the hole was simply covered over, and then somehow the spacecraft passed through Russian quality control inspections. The Russian Federal Space Agency at Cosmos is conducting a formal inquiry into the damage and has now asked cosmonauts to look for any evidence that could help them figure out exactly how and when the damage was done. Expedition 56 cosmonauts returning to Earth next month aboard the Soyuz MS-08 capsule have been asked to bring back any possible evidence that could help determine why the hole appeared. Cosmonauts have been asked to take samples of the glue that held the material covering the drill hole and search for other evidence, such as any shavings left after the drilling. As for the MS-09 spacecraft, it's slated to return to Earth in November. But as is normal practice, the orbital module of the spacecraft will be detached prior to atmospheric re-entry and allowed to burn up in the atmosphere. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. SpaceX has launched its 16th mission of the year, successfully placing a new telecommunications satellite into geostationary transfer orbit. The Telstar 18 Vantage was launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, deploying the satellite 32 minutes after liftoff. Stage 1's at startup pressures. Falcon 9's configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. 47 seconds into flight. We just heard the tail end avionics call out nominal. Falcon 9 heading through the clouds at Cape Canaveral, powered on 1.7 million pounds of thrust. We're throttled down for passing through maximum dynamic pressure. Vehicle supersonic. We're supersonic, heading out of the Earth's atmosphere. Vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. And now the call out, we're through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. As we get into the thinner areas of Earth's atmosphere, the loads are now decreasing on the Falcon 9. Now we're getting ready for chill-in of the upper stage engine. Similar to the first stage, we'll begin flowing liquid oxygen to the pumps. And we've heard the call out, MVAC D chill-in chill has begun. Now coming up, just past two and a half minutes into flight, the nine Merlin 1D engine will shut down. A few seconds later, the stage will separate, and then the upper stage engine will ignite to begin propelling the spacecraft to the first of two orbits for the evening. Two minutes, eight seconds into flight, Trajectory looks good. Merlin engine chamber pressures look good. Coming up on shutdown. Here we go. Stage separation confirmed. MVAC ignition. And we've heard the call out MVAC ignition. The chamber is up on power. Engine's looking good on stage two. Meanwhile, stage one is now coasting. First stage is now going to begin drifting down towards the drone ship. Following stage separation, the first stage of the Falcon 9 successfully returned to Earth, landing aboard the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Meanwhile, we're coming up in 15 seconds on fairing separation. Stage 2 on nominal trajectory. Bearing separation confirmed. And you can hear the applause from the folks outside Mission Control here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. The two fairing halves have separated in the vacuum of space. Now, as a reminder, on this flight, the fairings do not have recovery systems. We did not put parachutes in, so there's no plan to recover the fairings. Stage 1 entry startup. Ignition. The three Merlin engines at power, back Stage illuminating those titanium follow, grid follow, fins. Trajectory. Stage one entry shutdown. And shutdown of stage one. That completes the entry burn. Stage one landing startup. We have single engine startup on the first stage for landing. Back shutdown. Stage one landing with deploy. And we're waiting for confirmation on first stage on the drone ship. This is 
is recovery. Falcon 9 has landed. All running up here to proceed to procedure 11. We hear recovery calling out Falcon 9 has landed. Falcon also, Falcon importantly, Falcon. in the background just now, we had second stage engine shutdown on time. Guidance, navigation, and control engineer confirms we have a nominal orbit. Built by Space Systems Laurel in Palo Alto, California, the 7,060 kilogram Telstar 18 Vantage is an HTS or high throughput satellite equipped with both C and KU band transponders. It'll provide broadcast, commercial, and government communication services covering parts of India, China, Mongolia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. The satellite's biggest customer will be the Hong Kong-based APT Corporation, which has rebranded their portion of the spacecraft, the Appstar 5C. It's already been a busy year for SpaceX, and there's a lot more to come yet. Over the next few months, the Hawthorne, California-based company will carry out the final launch of 10 Iridium Next telecommunication satellites. There's the launch of the first GPS-3 spacecraft for the U.S. Air Force. Another demonstration flight of the Falcon Heavy, this one carrying the U.S. Air Force Space Test Program 2 satellite, and the first unmanned test flight of the company's new Dragon crew capsule, designed to transfer up to seven astronauts at a time to and from the International Space Station. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that as many as 50% of Australian and New Zealand men are likely to get cancer. The findings reported in CA, a cancer journal for clinicians, suggest the Aussie Kiwi region has the highest cancer risk in the world. The report shows that globally there will be an estimated 18.1 million new cases of cancer and 9.6 million cancer deaths in 2018. But for Australia and New Zealand, among men, the cumulative risk for getting cancer over a lifetime, that is birth to age 74 years, is 49%, more than double the world average of 22%. And for women, the rate is 33%, again about double the world average of 18%. A major trial involving more than 19,000 people has shown that taking a daily low-dose aspirin does not lower the risk of death, disability or cardiovascular disease, but it does increase the risk of major bleeding problems. The study, the largest clinical trial ever conducted in Australia, took place over five years, comparing the effects of aspirin and placebo in people over the age of 70 who did not have cardiovascular disease. The findings, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed slightly higher rates of death for those taking aspirin and no benefit in the rates of cardiovascular disease or disability-free survival. A new study has found that around 61% of the world's 356 known turtle species are either threatened or already extinct and the decline could have ecological consequences. The findings reported in the journal Bioscience show that turtles are now among the most threatened group of animals on Earth, and more so than birds, mammals, fish or amphibians. The iconic animal's dire situation is due to habitat destruction, over-exploitation for pets and food, disease and climate change. Archaeologists have discovered hundreds of ancient Roman gold coins in the basement of a former theatre near Lake Como in northern Italy. The coins dating back to the 4th or 5th century were discovered spilling out of a two-handled soapstone jar called an amphora, which had been buried in the dirt below the theatre. The archaeologists also unearthed a gold bar inside another jar at the same site. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. You see, science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics, is a regular contributor to the space-time program, and he joins us now to provide a skeptic's guide to the dangerous claims of a chiropractor who had been convicted after claiming to cure cancer. The problem starts from the basic uh, premise of chiropractic, which is that they treat the flow of energy through the spine and the interruptions to the flow of energy through the spine called subluxations are what causes all disease. Now, it is true that not all chiropractors believe that anymore today. So there are plenty of chiropractors who, in some sense, 
um, treat people in the same way that uh, physiotherapists would. Yeah. yeah, they focus on musculoskeletal problems, and and they're definitely science uh, based in the sense of the, they study anatomy and they treat people based on the available evidence. There is some evidence, not amazing, but there is some evidence that chiropractic can treat lower back pain. Again, it's not very strong evidence. Uh, generally, they don't do better than physiotherapy, but at least it's not worse, and it definitely is not contradicted by science. However, a lot of chiropractors still subscribe to the old uh, subluxation mechanism, and uh, the problem with that is that they believe that uh, subluxations cause, uh, again, all disease, and therefore a lot of chiropractors are members of anti-vaccine organizations, and there is a problem with the profession. Okay, so in the case that we are talking about uh, here is a, a Sydney chiropractor who was basically saying that he could cure cancer. He had a, a website called uh, Cancer Cure, in which he, tre- he published articles and blog items that described how chiropractic can cure cancer. And he was sued by the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Agency, APRA, which regulates all medical practitioners in Australia. It was the first such lawsuit against a practitioner of alternative medicine, which is an indictment on the regulatory system in Australia. But anyway, the the good thing is that he was sued and he was deregistered. He was fined something like $30,000. And some of his arguments uh, were really quite appalling and probably a little bit emblematic of the way alternative medicine practitioners argue their case. He said he did not think that using the word cure in the website's name would mislead the public as the word also meant pickled. So that's what he suggested was the case. And that's how he tried to defend himself. That's Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 